uh, and the recipient and today's speaker. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Ron. So I, I'm going to show my screen and uh, welcome you all to this uh, special event. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the Keith Reimer, Distinguished Lecturer of the ISHR. I'm happy to welcome Rong Li Liao. Um, my name is Thomas Eschenhang. I'm a pharmacologist from Hamburg and currently president of ISHR International. And uh, normally we would have had this lecture at uh, the World Conference or one of the section meetings, but as you all know, of course, we are in very special circumstances, so it's a pity. But on the other hand, we are lucky to have wrongly giving a talk. And so I'm just quickly uh, telling you what is the Keith Reimer Distinguished Lecture. Keith Reimer has been um, a very distinguished eminent cardiovascular scientist. He was professor of pathology at Duke University, died much too early in 2002. And shortly after his death, the Keith Reimer Distinguished Lecture Award has been established. And you see here on the left, the uh, I think there was a second one of, given by Gerd Heusch. And you see here the list of eminent cardiovascular scientists. And um, in the end here, you see Rong Lee. Uh, with the 2020, you may ask yourself, why the 2020? Well, that is Corona, and we didn't give one in 2001, and the thing was postponed. Nevertheless, we are here. Just a quick word, why uh, is Keith Reimer so important? He discovered many important phenomena. One is this wavefront phenomenon in myocardial ischemia. And the, the other one, and maybe some of you don't know, is uh, the phenomenon of ischemic preconditioning, the famous circulation paper, 1986, a paper which has been cited more than 6,000 fold, which is really amazing. And here is what he showed and his group, and this you may recognize other people you know well, Chuck Murray, Bob Jennings and Keith Reimer. And what they essentially showed in dogs is that, uh, as a strain of repetitive short ischemic impulses reduced injury of the 40 minute ischemia. And that's the famous preconditioning. And you see the effect on the right side, those hearts which have been preconditioned a much smaller in fact. Actually, it's interesting to see that this protocol worked well for the 40 minutes, but not at all for the three hour uh, ischemia following the preconditioning uh, uh, series. So that's actually something people maybe forgot over the time. And also the survival rate of the animals did not differ. Well, enough to Keith Reimer. A little bit about Rong Li Liao. Uh, she's now in Stanford. She did a PhD in 1990 in, uh, at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. She did a postdoctoral training. I think that was very instrumental in the Beth Israel and Brigham in uh, Boston, together uh, under the supervision of uh, Judy Guasmi and Joan Ingwal. And that I think gave the direction of her research. She founded her own research group 1996 to 2005 at Boston University School of Medicine, and then was re-recruited to the Brigham in 2005, stayed there until 2017 and what is it, five years ago, four years ago, was recruited to the Stanford School of Medicine, where she's currently co-director of the Stanford Amelioid Center, together with Ron Wittles and Michaela Lidke. She has published numerous papers and uh, has received several awards, really important uh, work with an early focus on the myocardium. She's, I think it's fair to say, Rong Li is really a cardiomyocyte person. She worked on dilated cardiomyopathies, genetic um, positive troponin mutations, very detailed work on contractor abnormalities and energy metabolism. Then she also did an important work on cardiac regeneration and then turned her attention over the last, I think, 20 years to cardiac amyloidosis and protein folding and homeostasis. And I went back a little bit in literature and found the first uh, that's actually, if you want to know a little bit more about Rong Li, there's a very nice piece in CERC Research 2016, Science as a Lifestyle, 
that's a nice title and it's a nice article. And I, I went back to this first paper in circulation on amyloidosis 20 years ago, I think really an important paper showing that infusion of the light chains uh, really uh, from patients with cardiac amyloidosis really cause dysfunction. And I'm very happy to learn more about this from Rong in her lecture. And Rong Lee, I stop my screen now. I'm looking forward for your lecture. The floor is yours. Thank you, Thomas, for the very kind introduction. Okay, let me see whether I can share screens. Is the screen shared? Yeah, but not in the presentation mode yet. Yeah, should be there. It's good now, right? Yes. So thank you, Thomas, for a very uh, um, you know kind introductions, and then also uh, thank for the committee give me this wonderful opportunity uh, to be able to you know uh, present. Uh, uh, for this uh, really important, you know, Keith Reinhardt's uh, lectures. And as many of us know, Keith has been a wonderful mentor and scientist, uh, and, and he really uh, impacts, you know, many people's uh, uh, research and life. So let's see. Let's see. Okay, so as I mentioned that earlier, as you know, uh, I think, you know, Dr. Uh, Reimer's uh, case is actually, it's really the father of myocardial ischemia. And for 25 years, he had really uh, contributed to understanding of ischemic heart disease. And along the way, he also trained many fellows and now many of them are, you know, uh, professors and, and in, the, in the various uh, 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 entities and contribute to science in uh, many different way. So this is really, it's my distinct honor to able to uh, uh, deliver this lecture. So today I'm going to talk about amyloidosis. So I think amyloidosis should be a no stranger if uh, I'm talking about Alzheimer, Parkinson, Huntington, right? We hear about this disease quite a bit. And so those actually is also the amyloidosis and mostly it's focused, you know, in the brains. And, but unfortunately, you know, amyloid also occur in the heart as well. So this is something we actually don't like to see, but it happens. So when it comes to the cardiac amyloidosis, there are many amyloidosis impact cardiovascular system, in fact. And so for the cardiac amyloidosis, and really depends on where the precursor protein are found. So they can be from the heart itself, like decimal related cardiac myopathy, and it's uh, alpha B crystallines and, and then Desmond has been shown to be able to form amyloidosis, crystallinis, and as well as cofilin also being shown to form amyloidosis. And then they actually also impact and lead to dilated cardiomyopathy as well. So the amyloidosis, we got the opportunity to start the, it's actually a different one. It's actually the precursor protein. It's extracardiac amyloid. And for the AO amyloidosis, it's most common uh, a cardiac amyloidosis. Actually, it's precursor protein. It's from bone marrow. It's immunoglobular lichen protein. And the other type, it's ATTR amyloidosis. And that affect in the heart. But however, again, their precursor protein is actually produced <clears throat> in the uh, liver. It's the uh, transthyrotin protein and producing the liver and depends on it's actually what type TTR protein or what mutated TTR protein, they can come into the two flavor. 
one is inheritable and the other is could be happen into anyone's in the late age. And so as Thomas just mentioned, um, my involvement with cardiac amyloidosis actually is uh, the collaboration with Ronnie Falk, one of the cardiologists very early on know how to actually diagnose amyloid disease. That's back to the time I was at Boston University. In fact, back then, Boston University is one of the very few internationally and nationally able to have a, a, um, a abilities, their physicians have been trained and to know how to identify cardiac amyloidosis and running is one of them. So for the longest time, the mechanism of amyloidosis has been the structure damage. Like I saying, it's a structure amyloid protein deposition, right? And lead to increasing of the cardiac and vascular stiffness, as well as the disruption of the electrical conductance by the amyloid fiber and lead to impair of a cardiac diastolic and systolic function and ultimately lead to death. And however, the clinical observation, actually, this is what uh, Thomas just mentioned, is made by Ronnie Falk. Um, I think it's a two decades ago, if not more, and showing that mortality of the AL, so showing here, as you can see, so showing uh, a mortality of AL and the ATTR, it's very different. And albeit their amyloid fiber low, it's similar. So then Ronnie actually asking a question. That must be something more than just amyloid fiber. Because if their amyloid fiber is similar, once they become an amyloid fiber, doesn't matter the precursor protein, their structure wise is very similar. So that must be not the cause of the, is the cause, but not what drive the mortality. So he just asking a simple question is that amyloid lichen protein has some sort of a toxicity. So we're saying, okay, that's fine. If you have that, uh, a sample can send to us. In the laboratory, we are able to answer that question, whether that protein has a toxicity. So at the time, I'm actually uh, working with Dr. Carl Epstein. Unfortunately, he passed away too early. And it's one of the cardiac um, a physiologist and the ones uh, really know how to do the isolated Lincoln dog fused hearts. Some of the senior uh, folk in the, in the audience probably were, you know, in some way know Carl one way or the other. He also has very close type uh, with uh, European colleagues there. So we're using an isolated Lincoln dog fused heart. So this is actually a mouse heart. And we take that as a patient sample from the non aos and then for severe uh, AL from the light chains and the medium. And so we can see that actually, you can see the dose dependence of increasing diastolic function. So means it's from the severe light chain, severe AL uh, amyloidosis, you actually elevate uh, and diastolic pressure much higher. And so this is really for the first time suggest there has some sort of toxicity uh, involved and that's potentially driving the uh, mortality. Is that true? Because you know, in order to determine those protein toxicity, actually it's sufficient to contribute the mortality. We really need to have a data to uh, demonstrate that. And the reason I actually thinking about using the zebrafish model, it's actually rather sad we usually get the patient's Ben Jones protein when we do the research. And unfortunately, oftentimes, when we try to go back to patients and try to get more urine, and guess what? The patient has already passed away because of this disease back then is actually no treatment. And most of the doctors don't even know how to treat them uh, or how to take care of them. And, you know, Boston University is one of them. And so we have very limited the light chain protein. So I go like, you know, if we're doing the rodents or uh, Lincoln dog perfused hearts, that needs too much proteins and which we don't have. So let's go to something small, small species, we say zebrafish. So at the time, and Callum actually joined uh, Brigham's 
And so uh, Shima's and Eva is who is trained and work with uh, Callum. And right now still uh, they both in the Brigham. And we try to learn the zebra fish because it's much more small volume circulating. So our light chain will go the wrong way. So she can inject blind leads with a different AL light chains and the multi-myeloma light chains into a zebra fish. And showing here, only the AL light chain when they in injected to zebra fish, it caused the mortality. And it's really pretty much like what we see in the patients. As you can see here in the multi-myeloma light chain, which is non-amyloidogenic, compared to AO uh, light chains, which is amyloidogenic, you can see here the left-hand side is the zebra fish uh, data, and then the, the right-hand side is the humans with the AO amyloidosis, with really, really uh, worse mortality, as you can see here. So this is the first time um, we uh, actually reported and that's a toxicity. And interestingly, it's not just a toxicity, the toxicity is actually dose dependent, depends on the amount of a protein. So we are actually pretty excited about this particular data because if it's a dose dependent, then that means their toxicity must be resulted from some sort of regulated uh, fashion. And this is actually dose dependent. It's actually very similar uh, to in the patient. If we can remove more light chains, uh, greater than 50%, their mortality is much better than those non-responder cannot remove their uh, light chains proteins. So this is just really uh, uh, ensure us that has a, some sort of a potentially pathway that's you know, working uh, to lead to this toxicity. So for the long story short, because this already published some time ago, and with a couple of PhD students and a couple of postdocs, and a lot of uh, uh, hard work uh, among them, we actually can really pan out really the signaling and the events cascades uh, in the using our uh, either the animal model, isolate higher models, and uh, to really determine that, right? So this is not like a you know, patient come to the uh, clinic, usually we don't know when the uh, disease start, but the experimentally, we know when the, the disease starts is when we give them the light chains. So they can see the cardiac myocyte first explode to the light chain and affect lysosomal functions and then also impact my uh, autophagy. And then that's what leads to, we're looking at the mitochondria functions. And then of course it's elevated uh, ROS and the cellular dysfunctions and subsequently lead to, you know, the calcium homeostasis got impact and as well as uh, uh, fun uh, functions and then eventually lead to the cell death. So with both in vitro and in vivo experiments, the pathogenesis of AO and myrdosis, uh, you know, uh, has been, you know, initially just a structure damage. Now we add on actually has a protein toxicity. And in fact, the protein toxicity is what's driving the mortalities and not actually the animal fiber. Uh, so I think this data, you know, it's very great to see, you know, as of today has been reproduced uh, nationally as well as in internationally. I think people recognize the protein toxicity of uh, AO amyloidogenic protein. So as I just indicated, you know, uh, AO amyloidosis actually can affect pretty much all organs in our body. And of course, once they go into the major organs, uh, they actually, for the heart, it's much more higher percentage and more than 50% of them, uh, close to 50% of them will have a congested heart values and because the amyloid uh, fiber deposition. Then also the second one is impacting the kidney and then also pretty much all organ in our body as I just indicated. So we thought it would be interesting and then important if we can identify the ways to predict you know, how the amyloid proteins are going to be deposited and impact them. And so we're looking into exosome. In fact, this is when I was at uh, Boston, 
uh, with the graduate students at uh, BBS uh, departments and at Harvard. And one of the students, uh, their thesis project actually working on the exosome on the cancer cell and to see whether they can also impact the cancer metastasis and what organ the cancer will metastasize to. We thought, so this is actually very interesting, you know, because, you know, the uh, ARO amyloidosis is actually very close uh, to the uh, multimyeloma. So multimyeloma is a cancer. The only thing on the multimyeloma also has a, a immunoglobulin chain produced. The only thing different than become an ARO is multimyeloma will not produce uh, um, uh, amyloid fibro uh, in the cancer uh, setting. So we thought that maybe, you know, the exosome may be hold some information about the uh, potential tissue trophism. So for this, we collaborate with uh, uh, Shamela Dobala and uh, uh, you know, Ilana uh, uh, Akawa and Brigham and as well as Jennifer uh, Woods, uh, who is the um, graduate student and when I was at Boston University and later on I recruited her to the Brigham and he, she remained in the Brigham and Shima then got uh, in our uh, group here at Stanford. And we're looking into the, uh, the role of exosome in the cardiac environment. So instead of just because exosome field is new to us, so instead of just looking at the um, uh, different type of tissue trophism, we decide to focus on the cardiac uh, because that's also we know more about the cardiac mortosis. And then we also, uh, uh, it's the one drive the mortality. So the giving the hexosome was isolated uh, from the uh, patient samples. We also ensure that, you know, the uh, uh, platys, um, uh did not uh, con con the patient uh, particle, uh, the exosome particle did not contaminate, you know, so with the uh, light chain protein because light chain protein is very sticky. We want to make sure the light chain protein is actually buried and carry inside the exosome. So we did a lot of, uh, uh, this is Oshima's work, a lot of characterization and to make sure that no uh, uh, light chain contamination in the exosomes. And so interestingly, we have uh, conducted various assays uh, to see you know, the exosome isolate from aero patient plasmas and then as well as uh, um, uh, myeloma plasmas and to see whether you know, they can impact uh, cardiac functions over cell death. And so indeed, in here you can see that only the exosome uh, purified it from the, um, the ARO uh, samples and with the cardiac environment actually uh, lead to the severe cell death as shown here. So this is actually uh, uh, the, the things I just indicated you know, the exosome uptakes lead to the cell death. And so similar to what we observed previously, we, uh, we found that, you know, air light chain contain exosome uh, exhibit cell toxicity similar to the light chain protein as we see. So this is something it's very gratified to see. It. And then exosome are also uptake uh, by uh, humans, uh, microvascular endothelial cell because uh, Shima is actually vascular biologist. So I have been learning vascular biology from her and it's a baby step. So it's very interesting. We extend our cardiac myocyte work to the vascular. So interesting uptake of the healthy uh, um, exosome uh, means um, the exosome isolates from the non ARO the patients has a less uh, uh, uptake compared to the exosome, which is from the ARO patients. And so, and also intriguing, intriguingly, so we find that AO exosome also alter the membrane permeability. As you can see in here, that the membranes and become leakier when the AO exosome is added to, to the chamber here. And then you can see that you add the AO exosome, you can see the hole now is it because it become membrane leaky versus uh, from the healthy uh, uh, individual, which is uh, uh, donors, uh, 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 donations on their plasma sample, 
So I think you know this is a very interesting observation. And then also when we call cultural exosomes 24 hours, they actually affect the angiogenesis uh, capacities of a primary human microvascular and the serial cell. And in metrogel tube formation assays, uh, we also see that, you know, um, the uh, 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 observe that the compromise in the serial angiogenesis. So we then interested to determine that, you know, what exosome may have on the endothelial cell activations and interaction with immune cell. So we conduct the endothelial cell monocyte adhesion assays and to determine the effects of AO exosomes on the endothelial activations and using the monocytes, uh, uh, resulting the monocytes uh, adhesion. And so when we stimulate the cardiac endothelial cells, you know, with exosome, we find that AO exosome induce monocyte adhesions in the human uh, 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 endothelial cells and the human microvascular endothelial cells uh, here. And compared to healthy exosomes treated with endothelial cell, showing significantly higher monocytes uh, um, uh, 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 intact. So our data show that only exosome isolated from AO patients when co culture with endothelial cell resulted to endothelial dysfunctions and the immune activations. So this is actually very, very gratified to see. And this opened up a different field. And I'm not a vascular biologist. So if that's vascular biologist in the audience, you know, happy to hear your thoughts on this. And so we go back to our zebrafish models because we are interested to seeing if the uh, exosome isolate from AO plasma sample in fact uh, impact the cardiac functions or mortality of a zebrafish as we saw before uh, on the immunoglobulin light chain protein. So we use the zebrafish embryo model to study in vivo functions, uh, effects of the exosomes. And you know, we actually like this a lot because zebrafish just require much, much smaller amounts. We just need two nanoliter of the membrane labeled exosomes and we can inject them and wait 40 hours. And then we can see their, uh, their mortalities and looking at their function as well. So we can see in here, right, the healthy birth AO exosomes. You can see that the exosome is from the AO, it's lead to mortality. Very similar to what we see in the light chain protein because we already uh, examined and noted in the exosome that has actually light chain protein carry inside. So this is the initial work on the cardiac environment. But the overall uh, uh, goal for this study on the exosome is we want to see whether if in any way by using the exosome, we can really get us uh, the prediction of the tissue trophism. As I mentioned, you go into the cardiac environment, the mortality is very, very poor. So we can see whether we can have an early diagnosis of, of determining how patient is going to have a cardiac environment or they will not have a cardiac environment that may have a time and then the strategy is different. So in collaborations with uh, uh, Suren Shin, it's a bioengineers and the, uh, Brigham's and we collaborate when I was there. And so we are using that experiment is still ongoing. We are using the organ on the chip and with the difference, you know, uh, um, basically different organ, uh, organ asomo things on the chips. So we will allow us to see what kind of light chain we're going to, what tissues, and to allow us to get more understanding of how the tissue trophism is got regulated. And I'm going to refer this back to you at the time I was at uh, um, uh, a BBS um, uh, a department at Harvard and with their um, students is a, a really work on the cancer metastasis. And we thought this maybe also can really provide some of the exciting information we need. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to uh, switch gear and talking about another current ongoing study and in collaboration with uh, Dr. Shamela Dovala, 
which is radiologist and a cardiologist. And so uh, we have a, a long-term collaboration. And the goal is to determine if using non-invasive imaging can be used not only to diagnose the disease, but also to measure the light chain toxicity in vivo. As I mentioned earlier, the light chain toxicity is very, very critical because if a light chain toxicity is a high, the mortality for the patient is really uh, 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 very high. And so that means they have to either really treat quickly on that. So uh, Shamela is, uh, like I saying, uh, she is a cardiologist and then a radiologist by training. And so he is, she has this interest in looking at the amyloid tracer. And amyloid tracer actually is very structurally similar to thioferrin T, which is actually the dye people use uh, for a long time uh, to really stand for the amyloids and the tissue pathologies. And so, you know, uh, we basically, we want to see, you know, the, um, the thioferrin T, it's this cation, Catonic uh, benzoyl you know, can you know be used and then to really help us to identify what kind of species of the amyloid uh, this uh, uh, dye is binding to. So interesting, Jamela uh, uh, noted that much higher for beta pill uh, signal often observed in the patient with active cardiac disease, as uh, shown here. So with active cardiac disease, you can see a much higher uh, uh, beta pill signal. And so Shamena's hypothesized that aiding for beta pill, maybe it's also capable to detect the protein toxicity because in you know, a higher and it lead to more mortality. And we thought you know, that potentially could be the, um, the toxicity involved. And giving the 18 for beta pill is not only sensitive to amyloid fiber deposition, it seems to uh, uh, retention uh, index is higher in the individual with active plasma cell dysplasia, and that's lead to this uh, um, hypothesis. So uh, we asked him the question that um, whether 18 for beta pill can be used to detect the protein toxicity. So, and then we using our ZBuffish model uh, to test this. And then it is uh, encouraging that our initial data showing that uh, light chain from the patient with the higher PET uh, signals um, actually uh, lead to the more uh, zebrafish deaths as is shown here. And so you can see that, you know, it's, this is something very interesting. And this is a, a grant funded by AHA and it's still ongoing. So we are very excited to see whether we can, you know, uh, really continue to, you know, working on identifies is that, uh, you know, what for beta pill is binding to, is it binding to monomeric uh, over fibroids. So current data show that, you know, the initial data showing that for beta pill binding higher in the protein, which is after four days incubations, and which this is the date, which, uh, the uh, oligomer, it's, you know, protofilament, it's kind of a, a develop. So we think, you know, what caused the toxicity probably potentially is their oligomer form. It's not just the amyloids uh, uh, or protein by itself. So this is something we are, you know, ongoing and it's working on that. And we also collaborate uh, with uh, people here uh, at uh, Stanford. And so one last thing I'm going to talk about, again, this is very, very, I mean, today I talk about many things actually unpublished work, and this is one of them. So the role of information, you know, so this is actually something never been think of and mentioned. If you talk to physician, uh, knowing, um, looking at the amyloid patients and you asking them, is information involved? And I think this is something, you know, um, they were saying no. And then I believe at the time I was in Boston University. And when I actually asking this question, because we have a observation very interesting. And this observation I made before got reproduced by a research assistant working in the laboratories. 
uh, um, uh, LA, and LA now actually start his uh, PhD study at Cornell. He just started uh, 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 last summer. And so uh, we see this in the aerial samples, you can see that a lot of apoptotic cell over that cell compared to, for example, compared to ischemic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy. And as we know, when the cell death, death occurred, you know, that quickly being a clear out because the death cell, if continues to stay there, maybe potentially trigger some inflammatory response or something other response. So generally, that's why the death cell is being removed readily quickly. But somehow for the ARO amyloidosis, it's not like that. And so uh, LA, when he was a research assistant in the laboratory, I asked him to reproduce to see whether we can still see this observation I had uh, when I was actually a junior faculty. And can this from the patient sample from the Stanford, will they also show the same thing? And indeed, for the long story short, LA also looking into it and also see that a lot of that cell is not that clear out. And we know that that cell not got clear out to the in the tissue actually potentially could be a source to create an inflammatory response because the death cell sits there and is not so quiescent depending on what kind of death, necrotic death or apoptotic death. So it's a very interesting. So he using you know the Luminex uh, uh, the the pro-inflammatory cytokine panel and to looking at this. As you can see here, it's very, very striking. Let me see here. It's very striking compare AL with active disease versus those in remission, as well as those in ATTR. It's completely different. So this has much more pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, noted in this group. And so I think this is actually, you know, one of the really pretty, uh, uh, solid evidence to suggest this information potentially really involved in the aerial amyloidosis. And so in order to really, really dig into this and the initial work is basically using this uh, um, uh, 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 Luminex uh, as uh, plaques. So we thought we need to go to more in-depth analysis so I collaborate with my former PhD students. And right now uh, he has been a faculty at UCSF and he was trained with Ramzi Musa for his uh, uh, um, a PhD, uh, uh, Ramzi Musa for his uh, uh, research work. And so he is really a very, uh, uh, really expert these days in the metabolomic. So we thought we send a sample to him and uh, I think they are running that right now. And this is the initial data from the first phase comes out. And this also indicated, and we still are trying to run additional sample and do more in-depth analysis. But for the first you know, uh, analysis in indicated information indeed involved in the AO amyloidosis. So this is something that really opens up a different uh, era and we can really think about potentially different treatment and also the potentially cause of the protein misfolding at the get-go, right? So could it be information come first and then from our body produce protein that more uh, are prone to be misfolded and then lead to amyloidosis? And so, and something needs to be mentioned here, we also using ATTR sample and ATTR does not look like a triggered information as we see in the AO patient. So I think this is something uh, we are working on that. And, but today in this platform has many really smart people in the audience. That's why I share uh, with our unpublished data and hoping can uh, really have a good discussion with you all. But the problem of information is, you know, we're saying, okay, information, can we do the anti-inflammatory treatment, right? And I see Thomas is laughing, right? So because nothing really worked these days for the anti-information, right? So every time we're talking about stress, information, it's very bad, but does not look like it has a magic drug 
we can pop it in and reduce our inflammation. Maybe exercise, maybe lifestyle. So something maybe we can look into on this. So with this, I'm going to summarize it. You know, I think exosome we isolate from plasma sample actually can really provide us some more additional insights uh, of this disease. And particularly we're looking for the crudes on the tissue trophism because we want them to stay away from the heart because once impact hearts generally, you know, without treatment, the survival is really, really poor. And, you know, we also, you know, uh, information could be, you know, play a critical role. And this is something uh, we are very exciting to looking into it. And then also we are working, continue working with the Shamela and looking at the for better pill signal, see if that can really using uh, imaging to determine the protein toxicity. How nice could that be, right? Because then doctor will know how to really strategize mm -hmm. Again, the treatments, you know, something they need to move quickly or something that has a time to wait on this. So uh, clearly that's, you know, a long list of the work to do, but that's my postdoc's problem. Uh, so, you know, but, you know, I think we, we really having funds uh, uh, doing all this research. And I think uh, as you can see that we're using M uh, zebra fish, we inject light chains, we try to create zebrafish animal model for ARO amyloidosis, but fail. We also create, try to create ARO amyloidosis, uh, any mouse model, we also fail. So must be something more. So we are looking into, you know, what's the missing point of why today's no one really has the ARO amyloid model. And so this is something we are really continue working on that. So stay tuned on that. So the last uh, few slides, it's something kind of, I wouldn't say fun, it's uh, probably alarming as we all know, population aging. And amyloidosis, much like uh, uh, neurodegeneration, it's always affects, you know, basically more the elderly. And so giving a population agent, we're probably going to, you know, see more of this. And indeed, this is one of the uh, data is not totally up to date, but you can see that, you know, for the uh, prevalence of the AOM doses is increasing over time from 2007 to 2015. But I want to add one point here. The reason the increasing of that, it could be one is due to population aging, and so more people, you know, elderly people got the disease, but also could be in the good old days in, in United States, only Boston University and Mayo Clinic know how to identify the disease, right? And then internationally, also very few places know how to identify this disease. So this increasing could be now has a more hospital know how to identify this mm -hmm. disease. So this increase may not totally just attribute to really increasing by number. Mm -hmm. I think maybe it's increasing by diagnosis. And so this is just to serve as the encouragement for people try to join the teams and then, you know, thinking about study on the amyloidosis. And this is actually a publications, you know, from two, um, uh, 2020, you know, it's like, whatever, it's a lot of publication on Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> but you can see that it's not started very early on, at the early on actually also very few, and but this is taking off, right? And now let's see this. This is what I search on the, using the keyword heart and amyloidosis. And then you can see the scale is actually much lesser. It's, you know, but we see the same initially has a very few, and now it's taking off. So this is on the publication. And again, this is just also show people probably more aware of this. And so then they will start working on that. So I think that's very interesting. But something I find it even more interesting is this two curve on the Alzheimer's disease and uh, cardiac amyloidosis, how they come out on the publication. It's exactly if we plot it, <laughs> the curve of the amyloidosis, how they form 
from the protein misfolding and then with aggregation in locations and to saturate the face and become amyloid fiber. So those curve is actually very similar on that. <laughs> so with this, I think this is something I dig out in one of the uh, news later and uh, showing, you know, this Senatorian lady, it's died at age of 114 and the cause of the death is ATTR amyloidosis. Mm. But, you know, second thoughts, if I'm going to live 114, I really don't care <laughs> what this is that <laughs> die for. I'm okay with that. But they're just showing that as a population aging, we're going to see more and more of this type of a, a disease. So, and so with this, I think we really, you know, it's still at the tips uh, of iceberg. I think so. Particular, I think all oh, we know now is population aging, and this is aging associated disease. So I think it will impact more people than we realize it. And of course, you know, the research is nice to, you know, uh, um, uh, really find some disease mechanisms and everything. But to me, mentorship and collaboration is even more important than just the science itself. Because along the way, you know, I cannot do this alone. I cannot do it without my fellow. I cannot do it with, with, without my mentor who trained in me. And so I think this is something we need to pass down the protons. So many of us in the academic institute, that's what we do. We also training students, you know, postdocs, you know, in the laboratories and, and, and with many, many collaborators. This is my time, you know, I spent good years in, in uh, Boston and I still love the city very much. And then come to Stanford. So got recruited uh, being one of the core uh, director at the Amway Center because they also know that a lot more patients, uh, um, they come in here. And so it's not just in the good old day, only Boston has and the Mayo Clinic know how to treat the patient. Now we actually got call for collaboration quite often in the different cities and different states. And, you know, this is actually our uh, MLO, uh, research teams, uh, both clinical and uh, uh, research. Uh, and then also this cannot be done without uh, other collaboration, like we not able to get uh, uh, um, the cardiac sample without working with the surgeries. And so they can give us the X-ray in the heart. And so, you know, and allow us to really study the, the mechanisms. And then also Elgin Lewis is the new uh, chief of cardiology and then Joe Wu is the, the chair uh, of the chief of uh, the Stanford um, uh, Cardiovascular Institute. I think it's pretty well known because uh, uh, Joe is very good, you know, I <laughs> advertise that. And then uh, G8 and, and then Wen Chao is the uh, person we actually collaborate to trying to looking at the structures of the proteins on the spot and, and what's the, uh, can we really inter, uh, 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 changing the structure and make them non-toxic? So I think this really take the advantage uh, for this to work and hopefully together, we can really wipe out this disease. So with this, thank you very much for the opportunity and, and the honor to deliver this uh, Keith Reimer's uh, lecture. Thank you very much and congratulations for a beautiful lecture and on a, on a fascinating journey uh, through this um, field. I think indeed you're right, amyloidosis is really uh, not only an important but fascinating disease and um, I think you made me, uh, I mean, uh, made me thinking about a lot of experiments that one should do and could do. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating experiment, uh, the field indeed. And I think you're right. Also in, in Europe, there are very few centers really concentrating on amyloidosis. And uh, certainly it's an underdiagnosed disease. So yeah. congratulations, yeah. it was really wonderful. Thank you. I tried to get track of the many um, questions. I think the first one was from Xi Zhong Wang, who is of course an expert himself on, on proteotoxicity. So I read you the question of Xi Zhong. Does amylogenic uh, light chains need to enter the cells to cause prototoxicity? And if so, 
Was the LC species detectable in cardiomyocytes? If not, how the extracellular light chain trigger the intracellular changes? Actually, I had a, sim a similar chain, a similar question. So, what do you, what do you actually, answer? This is actually, a very interesting question. So the protein itself, yes, we can see them internalized in the cell when we treat it with a cardiomyocytes. But I think, you know, we still, that's why, you know, I think, you know, uh, at the very last couple of slides, I'm talking about animal model. It's very, very critical. The zebra fish we're only using as a model for toxicity. And we still need the rodent or even the, you know, large animal model to allow us to really understand this very, we think about this a lot and a very interesting question and important question how the protein is folding and, and how the toxicity going. Because if you're looking at the fibro, it's always extracellular, right? Deposit, mm -hmm. reading, because this is not producing the heart. So they did not go into the myocytes. So if you're looking at the pathology of the sample, uh, what we can get on the patients, it's all extracellular. So it's in between. So you break that. So I think this is, but the thing is when the patient, you know, Apparently, you know, it's already I have amyloid and give us the expanded hearts on those. It's very sick. So that's why animal model is very critical because will allow yeah. us to see from the day one, it's just immunoglobulin light chain stages. What can you do? Mm. And so when we treated that yeah. with the light chain on the in culture, we did not see internalization. But you, but you see toxicity. But that could be, you see the toxicity, but we did not see the uh, internalization. That also because we're using primary cell, they don't live that long. So we mm. don't know whether if we prolong the time, mm. would they be internalized? Mm. Okay, so there's, an, there's another question of Jia Bin Quinn, or Quinn, I don't know, Posa Liao, the uh, AL exosome is very interesting. Can you tell me more about how you remove the background influence from other factors? Since we know that exosomes are a big cocktail and not easy to have consistent quality. Thanks. I think it's a good question. Yeah, it, it's a very good question. So I wish um, my instructor Shima is here. She is the one leading this. And let me tell you, it's very, very difficult for the exosomes because mm -hmm. We have to go to a lot of uh, uh, quality control, like you are absolutely right, because the light chain is sticky. So the light chain could be stick on the outside the exosome, mm -hmm. right, and was inside the exosome. So we're still working on that. And from some of the EM, we see both. We see insides and then we see uh, outside. So, but then, you know, we have to be able to do the clean one way versus the other. But I think, you know, light chain toxicity has been proven not just by uh, our group, by other group as well. So if and you have a tethering light chains, you know, you don't need to be inside. But I think the key thing for the exosome is you have insights. So then exosome can carry the, at least the hypothesis, can target where does it go. So it's not like just non-specific. If we're using light chain treatment, it's just a non-specific. Mm -hmm. So great question. Yeah, another question of uh, Xi Zhong Wang. Could be inflammation be the consequence of necrosis? I think that's what you suggest, right? Yeah, so this is what we're looking into. It. It's that the consequence of necrosis or that some other things. So we are looking into that. And like I saying, you know, we train as myocardial biologists. We generally don't think about inflammation on a day-to-day basis. So we actually, you know, very, you know, intrigued and trying to figure out, mm. you know, to learn more about this. So I don't have the do, answer. Do you know the identity of this many cell? I mean, you showed this picture with lots of tunnel positive cells. And I was wondering what kind of cells are cardiomyocyte. those? What we're looking at that it's a cardiomyocyte. The cell we're looking at, I, I show it's a cardiomyocyte. And oh. I began start do looking at the vascular cell. It's, uh, you know, it's because uh, uh, my instructor Shima is actually trained vascular biology. 
So she's teaching me on the vascular biology. So we start looking at the vascular cells. And then the same thing, they can be really impact and kill the vascular cell. So that's a focal phenomenon because I mean, at that, at that rate, it would dissolve the myocardium in a few days. Right? I mean, it, I mean, you showed a frequency of, I don't know, 5%, 10% or so. Yeah, and so a, a lot of the cell, yeah, a lot of cell deaths. That's actually one of the initial uh, observation we have from the human uh, cardiac you know, biopsy sample. And we see a lot of internal positive cell. And that's also very interesting because we know uh, internal positive cell will got clear out you know, it's not going to stay there, you know, forever. But somehow we able to see quite a bit of terminal positive cell uh, in the uh, basically human either biopsy sample or, or X printed heart. And so this is something, you know, we also very intrigued and trying to see how does that, you know, with the disease, mm -hmm. how does it impact? Yeah, the, uh, thanks. So Heinrich Tickmeyer. Uh, hi, Heinrich. <laughs> Beautiful story, Wang Li. Where will the metabolomic analysis lead you? So, so Henrik, uh, we may come to you. Uh, so we uh, actually just uh, uh, got the data and we are looking into it. And we're trying to see whether, you know, um, the Actually, we're trying to look into from the metabolomic and, and link to them to uh, information. And, but the thing is, this is got from the plasma sample. So we actually and uh, don't know the source. If that has information, we don't know the source. And then that alone, we don't even know it's cardiomyocytes, it's a vascular cell. So this is basically, you know, the you know, big question and something I may, you know, Henrik, I would talk to you uh, when we have a chance on this. So it's very, very interesting. At, at least metabolism, it's got changed. So now we want to also look into that and looking to seeing what's the source of this information it's coming from. So my, uh, uh, Mohi Jen is my former PhD student. He actually, when he worked with Ramzi Musa, he has this paper, it's pretty cool, uh, to really trying to looking at the difference in a metabolite. Because when we do metabolomic, we take the blood sample, we take whatever sample, it's all systemic, systemically. And then metabolomic is metabolite. It's not like you have a gene name. So you can see, oh, okay, this is cardiac. This is, you know, liver, this is something. So, and then some of the metabolite actually happen in, you know, different organ, right? So he actually has this initial paper. It's very interesting. He basically taking the animal model and then do the in and out of each organ, right? To seeing the, you know, the, the block go in and collect that block go out. And so we do that on every single organ. And so the paper is published. So we are debating saying maybe, you know, now with, we have this information, whatever, maybe we should try to see again, I'm going to fall back to the animal model because if we have the good solid animal model, then we can do that on the animal model and then we can do different organ. And so that will help us trying to interpret the human data. Hmm. Yeah, actually the, the next talk uh, by Dao Fu Dai, nice talk, Professor Liao. What do you think is, is related to this uh, idea? What do you think about injecting AL purified from amyloidosis patients into mice as a murine model? This has been reported in one or two papers on kidney amyloidosis in terms of treatment, what additional treatment may be helpful other than reducing production of AL? Yeah, so, so this is actually, we are trying to using uh, the, the approach right now, instead of using transgenic or, you know, because you don't have anything, you try to knock out, you can be overexpression of the immunoglobulin chain. So what we're trying to do right now is uh, it's using the, um, uh, the sequence of a patient's uh, immunoglobulin mm -hmm. chains and trying to using AAV uh, to overexpress those. Uh, so the experiment is ongoing 
uh, using the uh, adenovirus overexpressed uh, patients sequence of the light chains and seeing whether um, they can give us some you know cool on that so i mm. think this is actually in the field everybody struggle is no uh, amyloid model uh, animal model uh, and then the other things we were thinking about but that's a lot more expensive it's the large animal because mm. that also has a screw of salt you know that's why the reason ro rodent won't work need to go to the large animal model so mm. you know if we got a jackpot then we may consider to do the large animal mm -hmm. model. So yeah, for that, good. yeah, for that on the ATT arts, you know, Kevin Alessandro was my uh, a, a physician scientist, uh, and and he is has his independent research, and so he's taking over all the ATTR work, mm -hmm. and his animal model he uses exactly the ATT arts uh, using adenovirus and to overexpress and in and deliver. Uh, yeah, yeah, to deliver. Mm, and so, yeah. so I think it's uh, got some interesting uh, results. Yeah. So we are looking at EMs and then trying to confirm that. Great. So there's, there's another question. And then I think we are also almost done here. Uh, Charles Chung says, fascinating work. Very exciting as I transition to mid-career to hear that your lab is finding success while continuing to follow studies from your early career. Yeah, that's true. Question, since AL causes toxicity and the remaining apoptose dysfunction cells remain in the myocardium, are there functional markers, a strain, electric conductivity, et cetera, that can be used to supplement the tracer data? That is, uh, we actually never really think about that way. So, I think, uh, well, it's that the imaging has enough sensitivity mm. in the patients or what, what will we measure? Yeah, for the... Because what we have, we can only do in the rodent, but rodent it's giving small, so sensitivity has to be high in order for the imaging to mm. work. So, I mean, well, e email me uh, later on, we can uh, discuss yeah. more, whoever asking the question. There was Charles Chung. I, I think you can look in the, in this uh, questions and answers, right, Ron? Yes, all the questions are listed here and I can also send them to you after the, the talk. Okay, great. Okay, great. So and then there's uh, there's just a comment and I think with this we could, could it's, uh, uh, very good as a last comment, wonderful talk and explorations in a field that you pioneered. Congratulations, Rong Lee from John Brown. Oh, thank you. <laughs> nice talk, congratulations. Yeah, I can just join uh, these congratulations. It was wonderful for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. And good thank luck for, for this important work. Thank you. And hopefully we'll uh, spike interest at, from other people to contribute and to help. Now, maybe you can uh, continue the discussion with Heinrich uh, Tegmeier in Berlin. So don't forget June 2020. So June this year is a world conference in Berlin and I hope you all come. Okay. With this, I, I just leave the last word to Ron. I'll just say thank you, Ron Lee, for a phenomenal webinar. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, we really appreciate the support of ISHR, JMCC, Dr. Eshanagan, thank you as well. And uh, with that, we will close the session. The, this will be available on the YouTube channel uh, recording if anyone wants to view it or share it. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you for the thank opportunity. You. Okay, everybody stay safe. Yeah, thank you very much. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay,